Good morning. Uh, it's November 7th, 2017. Um, I'm here in the Zamora Library at Notre Dame. Uh, my name is Jeannie Yoon, and I'm interviewing poet Emmy Perez, um, who is visiting with the Institute of Latino Studies here at Notre Dame and the Creative Writing Program. So thank you so much thank for coming, you. Emmy. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for, for spending visiting. your time. I'm so, um, I'm really glad that I get to get this hour to interview you. Oh, and, thank you. Um, there's so much that I want to uh, explore and delve into with um, with your work and with your book and with you. the kind of poetics and the the life that it speaks, the life that it bespeaks and seems to flow from and respond to. So thank you for your time. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so I guess uh, just as a general first opening question, I, I'm curious about um, your early experiences uh, as a person that led you, that sort of led you towards poetry. Um, mm. What were, like, where did you grow up and where do you identify as coming from? Mm. Who were the people, places, things that um, sort of awakened you uh, mm. as an artist? Mm. So I grew up in Santana, California, which mm -hmm. is about 40 miles without traffic, mm -hmm. south of LA. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And um, my parents were from border towns. Mm -hmm. My mom was from El Paso, Texas. Mm -hmm. And her family had lived in a neighborhood called Isleta, mm -hmm. two miles from the river, from mm -hmm. the Rio Grande, mm -hmm. um, for hundreds of years, since it used to be part of Mexico. Uh, my father is from a border town. I call it a border town, but it's 30 miles north of the border, mm -hmm. uh, north of Mexicali, mm -hmm. um, called Brawley, California. Um, my, I have four, my four grandparents, three of them were Mexican immigrants, mm -hmm. um, and one of them was the native Tejano, where mm -hmm. my mother's family was from. And so I grew up um, surrounded by my family mm -hmm. in Santana. Um, I think that my early experiences reading, like my mother always encouraged my reading. She took me to the mm -hmm. library. She was very instrumental. Mm -hmm. My family um, loved the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And so we used to have like a little garden outside mm -hmm. for a little while. Uh -huh. um, so I think that they gave me appreciation of nature and the mm -hmm. land early on mm -hmm. in my life, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously like appears in my work. Right, right, right yeah. Um, and I'm just trying to think, when I was in elementary school, I had teacher, like one teacher said, oh, I love your creative writing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that planted a little seed. You know, mm -hmm. you have teachers along Definitely. the way who encourage you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember in um, seventh grade kind of rebelling against some of the writing assignments mm -hmm. as early as seventh grade. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Such an important and part I of the think, process. Yeah, and I think that that's part of like my process still yeah, today, right? Yeah. Or even when I tell my students, when I give you a writing assignment, please rebel against it mm -hmm. because I think you're going to find out something super interesting. Mm -hmm. But I remember in seventh grade, uh, my English teacher gave a terrible, I think terrible writing assignment to um, write a letter to the opposite sex trying to impress them. Huh. Um, and so wow. I was like a tomboy at that time and I was really not wanting to write this letter. Yeah. So I wrote this letter about, and she loved it afterwards. It was, you know, uh -huh. I'll take you to the baseball field and I'll hit home runs over the fence, even though I couldn't hit home runs over right. the fence. Right. And mm -hmm. I, you know, that's how I was gonna impress them. And so she, she loved it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think those little things like, I don't know, gave me affirmations, but I still totally. didn't think I was a writer or anything right. like that. Right. Um, but so, and then when I was a freshman in, in high school, um, I remember rebelling against another assignment mm. and our teacher asked us to write an essay about Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. and it was for a contest. And, you know, I didn't feel like I was the top student in the class. No one else thought I was. I certainly wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, I want to write a poem about mm. this. And it was, in retrospect, like the only poem topic or a paper topic on a social justice topic in, mm. that I can recall mm. in my uh, high school education. Yeah. And so I wrote this, like, rhyme. I didn't know how to write poetry, oh, really. Yeah, I mean, right. I just, and I was influenced by hip hop. I wrote this rhyming poem mm. and it won an award. And um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s son presented the awards. Oh, I wasn't wow. the only winner. There were other people uh -huh. from the county at uh, UC Irvine. And so all these little things, um, you know, right. helped okay. me, but I still didn't think I was a writer, uh -huh. you know, I didn't. Uh -huh. But and they were kind of feeding the well or something. Yeah. 
I think so. Or just you would look back and say, okay, well, yeah. other people had said it was right. okay. Like a constellation or something. Um, and then my in my senior year, my uh, English teacher said, you should be an English major mm -hmm. in college. And no one had ever said anything to me about college. Mm -hmm. And no one ever said, you're good at anything. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, I'll just do it. I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then I went to the University of Southern California for my undergraduate studies. Mm -hmm. And it, my first year there was really hard. I would always fall asleep in classes mm -hmm. because they were these huge lecture classes. Yeah, not very engaging. No. Uh, yeah. And I thought I was going to, you know, not do well. Yeah. And then my, I, I passed my classes. And then my sophomore year, I took my first poetry workshop mm -hmm. with Molly Bendel, who's a mm -hmm. poet. And she's still there. And she, I just love the class. Mm -hmm. And, um... I finally was like good at something. I don't know, like I felt, I mean, I wasn't great, but she was very encouraging um, um, in her sort of quiet way. You know, she wasn't cheerleading on the side or anything like that. Right. I could just I could right. just feel that she was encouraging me. Right. And I didn't know that as an English major, there was a creative writing track. And so I kind of switched from literature track to the creative wow. writing track and took all of these creative writing classes. Mm. And even when I look back to this day, I don't think of, um, you know, like some of the students that I have, they're, they're so wonderful. I love all of them. But they have publishing in their mind early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, you know, like, and I never thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I only wrote to survive. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's still true to this mm -hmm. day. I mean, I'm in academia. Right. right. Which is kind of like an inconvenience to my life. Let me say that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel really grateful because, you know, I have a job that allows me to um, be rewarded right. for my work. But at the same time, you know, some of the pressures are mm -hmm. inconvenient to the kinds of things that I, I want to, right. to write. And maybe the pace or rhythm to right. the demands that you exactly. work at. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, um, I think all of those things contributed. Um, when I, as soon as I was done with my undergraduate degree, I went to Columbia University mm. for my MFA, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I studied fiction writing. Mm, mm -hmm. I was, and I wrote a thesis, mm -hmm. a collection of short mm -hmm. stories while I was there. Um, but while I was there, the whole time I was wishing that I had applied in poetry uh, instead. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Interesting. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but I was very fortunate that when I was there, um, I had a professor, Carol Meso, mm -hmm. who is an experimental fiction writer, and she was my first um, teacher. And she's kind of, her work is really um, like a mix between poetry and yeah. fiction. And so yeah. I was really like lucky mm -hmm. that I was able to take her class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was able to take some poetry seminars and workshops with uh, Lucille Clifton right, right. and sure. Lucy Brock Broido. And mm -hmm. I, it was really wonderful in that mm -hmm. regard. I didn't have an overall amazing experience in my MFA program. Yeah, uh -huh. This is in 1993 to 1995. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like I said, I was writing to survive. I mm -hmm. wasn't writing for publication or accolades or mm -hmm. anything like that. And mm -hmm. I just, I feel really grateful that I had the opportunity to live in New York and to, I'd never been to New York before. Yeah. <laughs> I got on the plane and went to my program. Wow. And um, it was, I don't know, it was a life-changing experience it, including the hard parts, you know, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. uh -huh. For yeah. sure. Well, that sounds very rich. Um, I, I don't know if there's, I mean, I guess your trajectory from after your MFA, it's, it sounds like, you know, your MFA and for all of its, for, for its, even it, for its in, imperfection sort of cement brought you into like a life of professional writing Yes. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, as the kind of culmination of this quiet, like, process of self-nourishing and like mm -hmm. finding, finding footing um, mm -hmm. over time. Absolutely. And that's a really like beautiful. Um, I really. I, that's a really beautiful trajectory to me because I think you're right. So many undergrads um, or. A, there's there's a kind of like extroverted path to writing, which is like I know that's what I'm gonna be. Yeah, right. And I pursue all the opportunities. <laughs> and, but what your what your your path seems like it was like it came it emerged out of a kind of quiet determination yeah. from the outset mm -hmm. and found um, you found nourishment along the way, mm -hmm. um, and that kind of like it was a quiet 
kind of accumulation towards pursuing your MFA and deciding to mm -hmm. make this the center of your life. Mm -hmm. no, I think that's yeah, accurate. Yeah. That's, that's really yeah. awesome. Um, Thank you. And I, I wanted to ask, um, I mean, there's, there's so much in your, in your trajectory and I'm really interested in the way that you frame it from, a, from an early, um, from the early part of your life being sort of encouraged to s spend time in, um, I'm, I'm more interested, I'm still really interested in this connection between your early life, um, be encouraged towards language on the one hand mm -hmm. by your parents, but also um, developing a relationship with nature mm -hmm. and the natural world. And mm -hmm. you're right, I really strongly see both of those weaving through your book. Mm -hmm. um, they're um, in, you know, I had a kind of order of questions that I wanted to ask um, you, but I'm just yeah. going to jump yeah. around. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> um, I see, like, in, in With the River on Our Face, um, I hear, like, the way that you weave in kind of a, like a being alongside nature and speaking with nature and also considering, like, what is the poetic line and what does, like, what is this... Mm -hmm what is this technology that I'm using mm -hmm. to speak with nature and mm -hmm. to speak to nature? Um, so I hear both of those concerns mm -hmm. and I'm curious um, mm -hmm. how, I guess, um, I guess that's a question as to where this, where this book, your first full collection mm -hmm. emerged from mm -hmm. for you. Okay, so it's a long journey. <laughs> are you are you very, prepared to yeah. share another <laughs> like, long journey? No, it's a very long journey. So um, after, so I'll just kind of pick up because yeah. it kind of fits in into mm. the long story. Mm. After I finished my MFA, I I lived stayed on the East Coast for two more years, and mm. then I wanted to um, go to El Paso, mm -hmm. Texas, where mm -hmm. my mother is from, mm -hmm. because my mother told me the most amazing stories mm -hmm. about growing up. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I say amazing, they're not all pretty. Right. <laughs> you know, she grew up in a lot of poverty. Um, my grandparents had 10 children. Um, nine of them survived infancy. Mm. Um, they were very poor. Mm -hmm. um, so, but she would always tell like really vivid, engaging stories. Mm -hmm. And I thought at first that I was going to move to um, El Paso to sort of write this novel mm -hmm. about my mother's life. And mm -hmm. it ended up being poems of my first collection, but it's mm -hmm. still important to this next collection. Um, so I moved to New Mexico instead, and I was working um, as a GED tutor. Um, mm -hmm. for the Navajo Reservation, um, from people who came from the Navajo Reservation and from the Zuni Reservation and the local community mm -hmm. in Gallup, New mm -hmm. Mexico. And I was traveling down to El Paso to write my work and to do some research. Um, but eventually I moved to El Paso mm -hmm. and I lived in the neighborhood that my mother grew mm -hmm. up in. And it's important to this book because it might not be readily ev evident when you read the book, but I remember stories that my mom told me mm -hmm. of how her father would somehow divert water from a canal, which mm -hmm. was like a tributary or a little canal from the river, the mm -hmm. Rio Grande. And that was how they were able to um, grow some plants mm -hmm. that they ate and that helped to nourish them. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about my, my mother's poverty and I think, wow, you know, she exists. I exist because she exists. Mm -hmm. And so like, the lifeblood of this book is always to remember that that same that water right. like nourished my, my mother and right. kept her alive. Right. And, um, so then when I moved, I lived in El Paso for six years, and then I accepted a tenure track position in the Rio Grande Valley. Mm -hmm. And Texas is really big, mm -hmm. so it's like a twelve hour drive from right. El Paso to this new it, border community. Is it not quite? It's not quite. It's not one end to the other, is it? Um, Almost. Almost, it is. Really. It is from okay. the river. It yeah. is. I never even thought of it that way. It is. Okay, I was looking at a map and yes. trying to see where in relation, because the book is also structured, kind yes. of with the areas, to my understanding, with the regions of the river. Yes, in right. in somewhat in a kind of haphazard mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but I live in McAllen, which is not quite the end of the river. Mm -hmm. Brownsville is part of the Rio Grande Valley, and it, it, that's where the river ends, mm -hmm. and the mouth mm -hmm. appears in the Gulf of Mexico. So I moved down there, and I thought, oh, this border region is going to be just like El Paso, and it's mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but when I first moved there, I had been used to all the fencing um, of the river in El Paso. Mm -hmm. And so even though I lived two miles from it, I never really had a lot of opportunity to visit it. Mm -hmm. 
um, I would go to other places where it didn't make the border mm -hmm. and I was able to visit it. But when I moved to the Rio Grande Valley in McAllen, um, the, one of the first things I wanted to do was to go see the river because I'm like, where am I in this world? There are no mountains here, it's all flat. Mm -hmm. And I need to see the border, I need to see the river. And it was just so amazed that you could access the river. It was beautiful. I didn't go in it, but it was bigger, it was green. It was um, the nature surrounding the river mm -hmm. is just beautiful. I mean, the Chihuahua Desert is beautiful too in El Paso, but this is different. Mm -hmm. um, and so somebody told me, you moved down river. And I thought, oh yeah, I lived in New Mexico, then I lived in El Paso, and then I lived here. Mm -hmm. And so there's something there. Mm -hmm. and to my, the river is important to my mother's family. Mm -hmm. And so when I first moved to the valley, I was, um, you know, academia is stressful, it was mm -hmm. hard. And so I would go to these uh, wildlife refuges mm -hmm. near the river mm -hmm. as a way to sort of unwind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, like the first poem in the collection, right. and it's you, um, I wrote, <laughs> actually I spoke into a microphone mm -hmm. when I was riding my bike near the river mm -hmm. through the Santana National Wildlife mm -hmm. Refuge. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first time that I ever used speech sort mm -hmm. of as a way to write mm -hmm. my work, a first draft at least, mm -hmm. because I went home and transcribed it and changed right. it and edited it. Sure. Um, and that was a really different process from writing my, the little short poems in my first collection. Mm -hmm. And so nature in a way Trying to remember what your original question was about that. Just I, that yeah. was the yeah, 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 totally was, just where this book emerged yeah. from and where it began for you. And um, so I think that's where it began is mm -hmm. in that poem, mm -hmm. and and so that poem is um, a love poem in many ways. Yeah. And then, so the collection continues on, and, and after that, I deliberately tried to do re like poetry research along the river, and mm -hmm. so I would tra make travels all the way up to the headwaters mm -hmm. in Colorado, mm -hmm. and I had never done that before. Mm -hmm. I had never gone all the way up to the wow, where yeah, it begins. For sure. And it kind of appears in an organic way in the mm -hmm. book, so it's not like, you know. Right. It's not like a scholarly it's treatment right, of right. it all. No, I, um, um, th yeah. I think the way in which the various like historical threads and research scientific threads, um, there's kind of a taxonomic concern in here too. Not mm. concern, but there's a taxonomic interest in here mm -hmm. with the species of butterflies mm -hmm. and the plants. Yeah. And um, there's a real attention to the, there's a real attention to like the particularity mm -hmm. of things that grow around the river mm -hmm. and also to the a kind of a pair of maybe a resonant particularity with a resonant attention to um, to the particularities of your connections to the river and right. like of the of the pieces of your memories and your history and like what you researched kind of weaving into mm -hmm. that granularity um, it's really beautiful oh thank you yeah thank you. Um, and the, that first poem, actually, I, I was so struck by that poem, um, uh, and it's you, the one that you mm -hmm. just mentioned. And also, I misspoke by saying that this is your first collection. I uh, thought this is your first book. It's yeah. No, uh, the other one is kind of a has a weird length. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think technically it's a chapbook, but it's, okay. I never like uh, republished it as a full length mm -hmm. collection. Mm -hmm. And so, so do you consider? Do you consider? I consider it as a complete collection because mm -hmm. I don't really use poems from it. Mm -hmm. Except, I made a second edition and I included the history of silence in the second edition mm -hmm. of the book, of uh, Solstice. And so um, I included that one in here. But other than that, the mm -hmm. poems really don't appear in another collection. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's like a complete little book, even though I think it's like forty-two pages or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this collection, this really. Um, there's like a, this collection feels like the result of a journey, um, or it feels like the culmination of a journey. Mm -hmm. And um, it's when you uh, when you talk about speaking the first poem and it's you into um, into 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 a recorder biking through the night through this wildlife <laughs> refuge. Um, I that makes total sense because I was so struck by its its quality of being an invocation. Mm -hmm. um, and invocations being placed at the beginning of epics or long works mm -hmm. of poetry that address um, normally, I mean, I guess in like antiquity, those invocations address um, a deity or a muse that the poet is calling on to mm -hmm. speak through them. And I was so struck by this as kind of a 
an echo of that dynamic, but it's more a kind of summoning of this vast, unknowable other, and it's you, this mm. insistence on the you mm. and the you in the leaves bitten, you in the bitten leaves, you in the holes and the absences. This you is everywhere and nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of, that speaking to that, that confidence and insistence of address to the, this unknowable other that maybe is part self and maybe is part, you know, atmospheric, um, I think sets a kind of, it really establishes the attention that the book takes, mm -hmm. I think. Um, thank you, that's beautiful, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love <laughs> oh, that as a first poem. Um, and I'm curious about um, earlier when you were describing your, um, sort of your early uh, mentors or your, or your teachers, um, it brought up for me a question about influences and how you, um, how you take in how 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 you've taken in poetic influences in your development as a mm -hmm. as an artist mm -hmm. and um, part also because I, I I think this book is very concerned and uh, this book pays a lot of attention to influences and does a lot of mm -hmm. shows a lot of gratitude mm -hmm. and ex and citation mm -hmm. of various writers that have influenced mm -hmm. your work and. I hear the voices of Ceylon and Clarice Lispector, mm -hmm. whom I also thought of when you mentioned, um, when you described how you got your turn towards fiction during your mm -hmm. MFA program, mm -hmm. and Carol Masso, mm -hmm. and um, I, when you were just like a, Clarice Lispector just uh, writes a fiction that is like, very much like poetry, mm -hmm. and I'm curious as to what constellation of influences mm -hmm. like yeah. guides you. Well, um, way back in my MFA program, I remember, and this relates to the book, I remember being really influenced by um, a line, just one line of an essay by Charles Wright. And each line should be like, a po uh, wait, each line should be a station of the cross. Mm. And so um, Lucy Brock Broido had shared that with us uh -huh. in class. I, I mean, I've reread the essay since, and I disagree with a lot of other things that he said sure. in the essay, <laughs> but I just needed that one line, and yeah. uh, I just love yeah. it because it really helped me learn about the poetic line and because I'm like, culturally Catholic and I can, mm. I remember the Stations of the Cross in church. Um, but, oh, so that, that was like one like bit of influence. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about that longer poem in a minute and how, what I did yeah. with it. But, um, you know, early on I was influenced by, I remember Sherman Alexie's the business of fancy dancing, reading that in graduate mm -hmm. school, and I just loved it. Um, it's a collection of um, poems and short stories, mm -hmm. but I just, I loved it. Um, I remember uh, learning about Joy Harjo when I was in graduate mm -hmm. school, and the woman who fell from the sky, mm -hmm. she has a collection of prose poems mm -hmm. that is really beautiful. It's like one of my favorite, those two books are some of my favorite mm -hmm. books ever. Um, and she, it even, her book even came with a little cassette tape at that time, I think it was 1995, mm. it wasn't a CD yet. And so you could hear her oh, performing the work right. with her instruments, her wind instruments, it was very beautiful. Um, and I'm trying to think of other people. And so at that time, you know, I still hadn't really come into learning a lot about mm. Chicana and Latina mm -hmm. and Latino poetry, Latinx mm. poetry, mm -hmm. and or fiction. I had to learn all that on my own. Mm -hmm. um, it was around the time in my early 20s that I started to buy all these books and mm. read them on my own. So that's also been part of the journey later on. Um, you know that this book uh, references Gloria and Saldua mm -hmm. a lot, and mm -hmm. so I kept that book with me for a very long time. Never when I bought it in like 1993 or 94 did I think that I would keep it and mm -hmm. then live in the community that she mm -hmm. grew up in, because that's where I live now, is mm -hmm. in, the, in the Rio Grande Valley. And I don't think that the work completely resonated with me until mm -hmm. I lived in her homeland. Mm -hmm. um, more so when I lived in El Paso than previously, but then when I lived in her homeland, it, was, it just became evident. And she has a great attention in her work mm -hmm. to the land mm -hmm. and her family. They were farm workers, mm -hmm. but there's still this beautiful attention, you know, even though you think of that labor, right? That mm -hmm. labor is so difficult, but there's still such an appreciation mm -hmm. for the land in her work. Mm -hmm. And I think that 
that's an influence in, in this book a lot. I mention yeah. her a lot yeah, in this book. Yeah. It's sort she's of like kind of like a guardian <laughs> angel in this book. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I think I mentioned Lorca in mm -hmm. the book to mm -hmm. um, Garcia Lorca and the Inger Christensen. Yes, oh, I love her Me book too. Alphabet. Me too. Yeah. Oh, oh. that think, is such an amazing yeah. book, and it reads so well in translation, Definitely. which is kind of unusual for such a musical book that mm -hmm. relies on like the alphabet mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I love that book. Yeah, I do uh -huh. too. I do too, and I, you know, I really appreciate it. Um, your drawing Inger Christensen into your book, and I think the that the, the, I, I can totally see a homology between the scale of Inger Christensen's intention. Like these things exist, these tiny things, <laughs> that, these tiny things exist, and there's a similar um, I don't want to say a dearness, but mm -hmm. an endearment and yeah. like recognition right. that I hear in this book too. Oh, thank you for reading it so closely. <laughs> oh, it's, it, it, <laughs> it asks to be, um, it asks to be read closely, thank I think. You. Um, thank you. And I want to just talk about that for just a minute because mm -hmm. I was really amazed when I moved to where I live now about, you know, just the natural beauty. Mm -hmm. But also what I forgot to mention earlier is that when I first moved there in 2006, I was amazed that you could see the river and access it, yeah. and there were no fence. There was, you know, not one fence or anything like that. Um, but that was the same year that the Secure Fence Act was right, signed into law by right. George W. Bush. And so, I uh, another big part of the book is I witnessed the building of the border walls uh -huh. in that area, um, starting in like 2008 and 2009. And I forgot to mention that early mm -hmm. on. So I went, and there's this beautiful place, and then I saw the building the, of border walls. Right, yeah, right. Before no, I, this current. President even yeah. started talking about it, yeah. and I think some people forget that there are walls there already. Right. Yeah, what but we can go back. I just wanted to say oh, that I we, forgot to mention that we can go everywhere. At the beginning, I, mean, I, I had questions about your yeah. about your witnessing of the border yeah. wall too, because yeah. that is also such a strong presence in mm -hmm. the book um, of a different sort, obviously, mm -hmm. than Inger Christensen mm -hmm. or Ansel Dua, um, and it just out of curiosity, what is the state of the, what is the status of the border wall? in your community okay. right now? So um, we've been organizing, I mean, I've been helping a little bit with the activist efforts. We have some great activists in the mm -hmm. community that um, I try to attend meetings whenever I can, mm -hmm. um, but they do such great work with the local Sierra Club and La Union del Pueblo Entero, and um, there's another uh, group called Save Santana National mm -hmm. Wildlife Refuge. Mm -hmm. So when I mentioned at the beginning of the poem and it's you, that was written in the Santana National Wildlife mm -hmm. Refuge, and now that National Wildlife Refuge is on like the list of places mm. to build a border wall through, okay. which is just like so shocking. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we've been, um, you know, writing petitions, writing to our senators. Mm -hmm. um, the, the activists have created lots of. Um, protests this summer that I participated in, um, and we just continued to do our best mm -hmm. to, to fight it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the border wall is, there's plans for it beyond the Santana National Wildlife Refuge, right. but that's like the thing that upsets more people, right. unfortunately, because to me, like the wall is a symbol of white supremacy. Yeah. But for other people, they just see it as a destruction of nature. That's mm -hmm. one of the things. It's not all of the things right, that it right. destroys. And but we'll take whatever yeah, <laughs> support yeah, we can get. Right. Uh huh. But right. it's um, you know we do have it in pieces uh, already mm -hmm. um, along the border. And what some people don't realize is that the border walls aren't like right next to the river per se. Mm -hmm. Some of them are kind of close to the river, but there's a lot of no man's land mm -hmm. where um, people are you know they own the property but they have to go through a gate to get to the other side of the property. Mm. Right now, like there's a cemetery near Brownsville, I just read an article about, and the cemetery is on the other side of the border wall. And right now people can go through the gate, but they're gonna put a gate on there. And so the mm. people who have relatives in this sort of oh, no man's uh -huh. land are not gonna be able to visit go. there. Yeah. Wow. So um, yeah, there's a lot going on. and. Um, there's a lot has been going on mm -hmm. since 2006. It's not only, and I wrote this entire book before right, um, right. this recent president be even became a contender. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so 
sometimes people get confused and think, oh, you wrote this in response to him. And no, this right. has no, been happening no, for a long time. No, it's just still <laughs> really relevant. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I think you're, you, you, you were talking about the no man's land and, and the kind of reality of the border wall and that it actually is really piecemeal and that the kind of, what I hear in that is that like the forces that are contriving to build the wall, I mean, it's one, uh, it's it's as generalizable as like it, it's it is a symbol of white supremacy and every inst every motive that is building this wall comes stems from that violence, mm -hmm. um, but the, the kind of agents that are doing that and the fact that the wall even stands in pieces is so. Mm -hmm. um, I have I don't almost makes me speechless mm -hmm. like the the you know is a wall a wall when it's in pieces mm -hmm. i think you know in the case of this wall it it the kind of the what it symbolizes or what it wants to become like is so foreboding that mm -hmm. um even a wall standing in pieces is like a violent gesture mm -hmm. and um i'm curious about uh and not just walls but i'm curious also about ideas of bridging and conf and other kinds of borders that you talk about. I think, I mean, there's so much, um, there's so much about borders and confluences mm -hmm. and different kinds of ways of rethinking border, mm -hmm. existence at the border um, mm -hmm. that don't have to do with state lines or walls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm curious as to like, you know, you come from a family that, you come from a family that proudly, that, I mean, proudly might be my own words, but that inhabits the border and it seems like you have a familial and historical and bo even bodily knowledge of what it means to be at a border mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how yeah. that inform how that informs how you live and how you write and mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'm, since I grew up in Southern California and at the Texas borderlands, um, a couple hours away from the border, we used to go to Tijuana. We would cross that border mm -hmm. a lot, and um, and we would just go to eat or you know to buy things. Mm -hmm. um, my my father and brother and step grandfather used to like to go fishing in Ensenada, which is a little further south mm -hmm. of, of Tijuana. But I always remember like and those border crossing incidents. Mm -hmm. They were always very strange, right. you know. Um, so I appreciate like that you recognize that I. You know, on the one hand, there's the border, the artificial right. border, and the militarization of the border. But on the other hand, there's this other life beyond mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I never had the chance to. I haven't visited yet where my grandmother was born, where any of my grandparents were born. I've been in the states mm -hmm. that they were born in, but I never have had the chance yet mm -hmm. to go to visit um, those places. I will someday. Mm -hmm. Been I've traveled in in Mexico, but not to those places, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, living, I, I think that purposely moving to the border was, um, the Texas borderlands, was a sort of resistance to becoming this assimilated creature that mm -hmm. I felt that growing up um, had the path. I mean, even though I was always culturally connected and my family is very culturally connected, I also feel that a lot of people, um, where I was growing up were being encouraged to assimilate mm -hmm. and I just didn't want to go on that path. Mm -hmm. And so like my moving to the borderlands was a way to actively resist that mm -hmm. uh, for myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if I'm answering your question though. So could you Does, restate? Yeah, no, I'm just, I was trying to actively resist that. And so even though I've had that sort of border consciousness as a child when we yeah. would go into, I, um, unlike a lot of my students, I don't like now have a family that I know of that lives on the other side of the border, but I want to speak to their experience because mm -hmm. for them, a lot of them still have family that lives on the other side. Mm -hmm. And because of the you know militarization of the border, because of violence in Mexico, not mm -hmm. on our side, it's become much more difficult for them to to visit with their mm -hmm. family where they had be, you know become really used to always going back and forth. And my mom mm -hmm. talks about that too when mm -hmm. she was growing up. Like she had relatives that lived in Ciudad Juarez and mm -hmm. that they would go back and forth. She was sent to her grandmother's right. house in Mata Ortiz, Chihuahua during the summer. Right. So it was, she would take the train and it was a lot easier to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And now um, with both 
you know, the militarization, the uh, more militarization of the border, and also with the um, the violence, mm -hmm. um, with the drug wars in Mexico, mm -hmm. um, which is related to our consumption of drugs here in the mm -hmm. United States, it's become much more difficult for for borderland people mm -hmm. to maintain their relationships right. at the level that they'd like to maintain them. Right. Um, something else that's interesting um, where I live, and you might have heard about it in the news. Mm -hmm is that um, undocumented residents of the borderlands, they can't really cross checkpoints mm -hmm. that are within the United States. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like right now, um, some of my students who are undocumented, they can't leave the mm -hmm. Rio Grande Valley. They can't go into Mexico. They can't, uh -huh. they can't leave um, Valfurias, which is like on the way to San Antonio. Uh -huh. And so even within where we live, it's this militarized wow. space. Yeah. Um, and there was a, a little girl recently, 10 years old, uh, undocumented with cerebral mm -hmm. palsy, mm -hmm. and she's from Laredo, and she needed emergency gallbladder surgery, and they sent her to Corpus Christi, which isn't right. that far away, but the border she was patrol, apprehended. She was, you heard of the story? I yes. saw, there yeah. was video right. and footage of her being forcibly right. removed, um, right. Right. and I think That's there's it. been, it's, I don't know, I haven't followed it closely, but it seems like there was a lot of outcry over that, and she's been allowed to seek her seek her medical treatment, but I'm not sure about the status of her. She was um, placed in detention, uh, mm -hmm. immigration detention, and um, she's out now, but mm -hmm. I think that they, um, there are proceedings for deportation that they are gonna need to fight. Right. So, so you asked me a question about borders and sort of like um, the fluidity and everything mm -hmm. of them. But it's really hard for me right now to think about that because there's so much going on. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think I'm answering your question because yeah. I can't help but no. think about the violence that um, that our, the community I live in is right. experiencing at the hands of the state. Right. Um, right. And so I'm sorry, but I did no, get to go yeah. to Mexico City this summer mm -hmm. and it was like, I went with some colleagues and all of us were saying how grateful we were for the opportunity because in the last 10 or so years, we feel like we've been cut off from, mm -hmm. from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And even our institution was not encouraging travel to Mexico mm -hmm. for presentations and such. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's been really hard because in the past 10 years, we just have not had the same connection mm -hmm. that we've always had. Mm -hmm. When I first moved to the valley, I would walk across the bridge to Reynosa, to Matamoros, mm -hmm. and to other places, border crossings, go have dinner, go have lunch. Mm -hmm. And now that's just not not as possible anymore because wow. mm -hmm. of the drug wars. Right. I mean, you can do it, but and now right. they have little kids, I just don't want to take them across. Right. But it was fine to fly to go to Mexico City and everything. Right. And you could do it. It's not Right, but the but yeah. the channels are restricted and highly monitored and controlled yeah. and um, I totally I think I think you do answer my question actually mm -hmm. that like the idea of actually the, you know, somewhat poetical consideration of borders as fluid is only possible within a space where, um, like, is only possible before, um, long before militarization, like, before intervention yes. by political, um, by political agency and uh, militarization. And um, for me, that just kind of returns to this idea that I, this idea of like the the space in which we are allowed to be poetical and the space in which we are allowed to like um, elaborate and dream is actually a, a space bounded by real political yes. and physical limitations. Right. And I think your poems are highly aware of that mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, and you, that you as, a, as an artist and an activist and a community member where you live seem really aware of that too. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I'm curious, how has, what is the, how has your, um, can, you, can you speak more about how uh, living where you live and especially in light, to my mind, of what seems like um, kind of the, like a journey towards homing for yourself, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, you returned to El Paso, mm -hmm. which was the birthplace of your mother, mm -hmm. your mother, and then, you know, kind of that meeting the confluence of your professional mm -hmm. life as a writer brought you to where you live now, mm -hmm. um, expand, thus expanding your idea of kind of a homeland or a homeland at the borderland. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I'm curious as to how that relationship has evolved and as you um, as you keep living and thinking and experiencing and raising your children mm -hmm. in that community, how has that influenced the way that you approach your work mm -hmm. as an artist? Okay, no, I think my work now is changing. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that I write, or each new project always is some sure. aesthetic challenge or, good, or different. <laughs> yeah, good sign, right? It is, it is. Yeah. Um, you know, when I wrote with the river on her face, I had a lot more time. Mm -hmm. Most of it was written before I had kids. Mm. Um, I revised a lot of the work after I had kids and wrote a couple of poems, but most of it was written um, before children, so I had lots of time mm -hmm. to go and by myself mm. into these places and think. And um, so now, um, you know, raising children on the borderlands is wonderful because my children are growing up bilingual, mm -hmm. and that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, I love that about it. I just love it. But the violence that I f feel that I am experiencing because of the state mm -hmm. in, in the form of these walls and and like I you know I think if that wall comes I'm going to I'm leaving. <laughs> like that's yeah. I don't want to live here anymore mm -hmm. if there's more, you mm -hmm. know. If they're going to take away like this place that I used to love more than anything mm -hmm. in this land like the Santana National Wildlife Refuge. I say that sometimes yeah. and then other times I think oh I can't leave you know that's, mm. that's that's reactionary that's silly I have to stay um, but I do think that mm. <laughs> and so my work is changing in the way that I think that when I was writing this book I thought I was being really overt and mm. um, not subtle and I think now it's even more overt and mm -hmm. also, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm feeling sort of an impatience mm -hmm. with, with subtlety right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling an impatience with what academia prizes in poetry. Right. Um, not that I don't appreciate subtlety, and right. I, I love subtlety, of mm -hmm. course, but I'm feeling very impatient with it because totally. it's too slow. Yeah. I hear <laughs> it's, that. It, it's too slow. I and hear there's that. too much that needs to be done. I hear that. Yeah. 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 There's like, and again, I think it's. I think <sighs> you're. What you. Uh, what I hear is like, a really, um, there that, you know, a subtlety that's not a, a subtle. There's a way in which subtlety can, ignore or kind of end up ignoring or obfuscating the very real concrete concerns that deal with living bodies right. like in the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Does that, um, I think, are these concerns, I, I know you're working on your next book, mm -hmm. um, where do these concerns um, play into your into your current project and where, yeah. how, like, where is your thinking and... Yeah, so my current project is um, you know, I'm still trying to figure out the aesthetic flow as I write mm. each piece. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's going to be much more of a hybrid work. Mm. Um, you know, so I think that the pieces are kind of poems and essays had babies. That's what mm. I like to call them. Lyric <laughs> essays. Yeah, lyric <laughs> essays, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think that I'm going to, um, you know, they, they might look more like prose poems or mm. lyric essays, mm. like you said. And I'm not gonna, you know, it's just gonna be whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Whatever they wanna be mm -hmm. is what they're gonna be. Mm -hmm. So that I can talk more directly about some of these issues. Mm -hmm. Especially as a, as a new, relatively new mother. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I tentatively am writing, I call, I'm, one of my son's names, well, I have one son, is Joaquin. Mm -hmm. And there's a famous poem by Corky Gonzalez that was published in 1967 called I Am Joaquin. Mm -hmm. And it's over 40 years old, but I, when I had my son, I said, I'm going to call him Joaquin only if I call, I name a poem, I Am Joaquin's mom. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is kind of like the working mm -hmm. paradigm, but I'm sure that the title of the book manuscript will change over time. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the pieces that I'm writing have to deal with children mm -hmm. and, and mothering on the border, mm -hmm. um, but also sort of from a global perspective. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years ago, you might have heard of the surge of undocumented and unaccompanied mm -hmm. um, young people from Central America, mm -hmm. and most of them passed through the Rio Grande mm -hmm. Valley where I live. Mm -hmm. And so it was just like you read about it in the news and we're living in this place and we don't really get to see them, but it was just heartbreaking for me to think of um, what it would be like for a parent to have to say goodbye to their child right. or to be already in the United States waiting for them to cross unaccompanied. Right. It's a very dangerous journey. Um, 
And I don't think that I have as much to say about it as someone like Javier Zamora, who wrote a beautiful book called Unaccompanied. Mm -hmm. He actually experienced right, it. Right. But those kinds of things, um, you know, are are on my mind in writing this mm -hmm. collection. Um, things that have to do with, with um, mothering and, right. and childhood, yeah, um, and um, raising children, <laughs> yes. I see all of those, I see kind of the ancestors, immediate ancestors of those concerns in with the, with the river mm -hmm. on our face, actually, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, both at the formal level and at the thematic mm -hmm. level. Um, mm -hmm. I think there, I, I don't know if I tapped it, but there is a poem in which you, or I don't know if it was in your, your notes, but um, where you're responding to the, to uh, the, uh, there was, there was an undocumented minor, unaccompanied minor oh, who yes. was found um, in the desert. And you, I think this poem ends with the failure, like this failed comparison between the body and, and a sponge. Like the mm. body doesn't just sponge up water it, there and it, that, Kind of, I, I have chills actually repeating that um, image because this idea that we are not, you know, for it, that kind of bespeaks to me. Um, it actually even resonates with where you say you are in your poetic thinking, like mm -hmm. metaphor and lyric and subtlety. They're not inexhaustible resources mm -hmm. and they're not luxuries, mm -hmm. and we can't just mm -hmm. draw on them in times of drought, mm -hmm. of spiritual and political drought. Um, That's really. Well stated. <laughs> so, I mean, I, it's all here. <laughs> like, I wish I could. I wish I had that poem right at hand. No, it's the really, last poem of the collection. Right. It's on page not, eighty-eight. Not one more refugee death. Right, and right. I did. This was the last poem that I wrote for the collection. I kind of added it. And this is yes, I wrote this. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was two thousand fourteen. And yeah, this is kind of like the bridge to the next collection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what happened is this young man had crossed um, the border. He made it across, and um, they found his body because he had heat exhaustion mm -hmm. um, across the river near my community. And, um, and it was just so sad. I think he was 14 or 15 years old. And yeah. he made it, you know. But, yeah. he, but then he just needed water right. or had heat exhaustion. Right. And, um, right. <clears throat> um, and it also makes me think about... Um, I don't know, it was like a way for me to, to talk about water again mm -hmm. at the end of the book. Was, the mm -hmm. whole book is about the river. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not just a symbol of this idyllic, beautiful, <laughs> no, <laughs> spiritual right, thing. I mean, it's, right. um, he didn't die in the river. And some people do die in the river. But um, I think more people die um, because of the militarization. And mm -hmm. so they, once they cross the river, they have to go through difficult spaces to get past mm -hmm. those checkpoints. And so, like I said, there's a checkpoint about an hour and a half away from where I live. And so a lot of them have to cross around through it mm -hmm. in very like hot places mm -hmm. with very little water and help. And mm -hmm. that's where a lot of um, mm -hmm. skeletons and remains have been found. Mm -hmm. And yeah, mm -hmm. so I don't think I'm on the topic again, but I, I, I keep meandering like, around. No, I, like, I, I, no, I and, hear like, you. And yeah. I think that, that um, that searchingness is kind of maybe one of our only possible antidotes to a moment in which um, everything that's sort of contriving the, this new militarized border says, stay where you are. Mm -hmm. Don't look around, like, mm -hmm. stay where you mm -hmm. are. And if you move, then, you know, to, to move in spite of that threat and to move even, like, creatively against that threat, I think, is like the only, maybe one of our only yes, um, absolutely. ways forward. And um, there is such a concern with water in this book and water and river, water and the river and the power of this river and the ways in which we've divided this river with names, but the kind of continuity um, of this river as the, as it divides two countries, but also as it's, um, as it divides your experiences with, or the speaker's experiences with the river. Mm -hmm. Like it's a place of enjoyment. Mm -hmm. It's also a place of witness. It's mm -hmm. also a place of formidable, like power over life and death. And um, I, uh, I'm, I guess I, I had a, the question, I had a question before we started about the title of this book because this 
I actually didn't even recognize this until partway through, but your, your title is With the River on Our Face. Mm -hmm. And our face, you know, the, plur the plural of the possessive and the singularity of face, I think, um, really struck me. And mm -hmm. I'm curious, where did the title of the collection okay. come from? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of grammatically incorrect, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and some people have tried to correct me, like, no, 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 that's no, no, not no. what I'm doing on purpose, <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's not evident in the book, but, you know, when I was growing up, I was used to hearing um, people be called wetbacks, mm -hmm. which always bothered me. Um, now where I live, people say it in Spanish, which mm -hmm. doesn't make it any better. They right. say mojado or even mojadito, which kind of makes it a little bit Endearing, cuter. Right. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. yeah. But still, yeah. And so I wanted to write a title that sort of was against that. And um, I didn't want the water to be on our backs. I mm -hmm. wanted it to be on our face. Mm -hmm. And that the face is collective because we're all together. Mm -hmm. I, that's how I, I feel yeah. about it. Um, yeah. You know, the national media and our current president um, says the most horrible things about mm -hmm. Mexicans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I wrote this before he existed in right. my imagination, you know. Right. He didn't, I know he existed, but not in my imagination. Right. And, um, but everything else leading up to that you know, it's always been there that mm -hmm. he and what he stands for has always been there, perhaps not as overtly right. as he is. And so I wanted to think of this as a more of a spiritual connection yeah. to, to the land because mm -hmm. in my mind, most of us have always been here. Yeah. And so, um, you know, as I mentioned, my family lived in El Paso when it used to be, when it wasn't the United States before mm -hmm. the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo made mm -hmm. it the United States. And so, um, to be treated as um, not connected to the land is, is very disturbing to right, me. Right, yeah. right. It's, uh -huh. <laughs> it's kind of the first um, first blow of a forced separation mm -hmm. that also is dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. um, I will guess as my, my last question, mm -hmm. um, which, wasn't where I, which wasn't what I thought my last question would be, but um, you talk about your, your thinking about motherhood at the border, mm -hmm. and that is so compelling to me because motherhood and mothering and just everything that motherhood entails like the nurturing and the long-term attention mm -hmm. really like the deep investment in a life um, and you this this undertaking of motherhood at in a place where life is being systematically or there's an attempt to systematically control and disperse and deracinate mm -hmm. and dehumanize um, I'm wondering how motherhood, if and how motherhood is a act of resistance for you? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, I think it is an act of resistance even against my own like hopes at one point because mm. I used to be very proud at one point to say, I'm never going to have kids. It's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> how can I be a writer if I have yeah. kids? <laughs> it's yeah. just so hard. But then as like time passed and the opportunity to have kids was dwindling, that's when I decided to have kids. So in some ways it was an act of resistance mm. against myself mm -hmm. and I realized, wow, I really want to know more about life in a way that I feel like I can't know without them. And that's just particular to me. Everybody's sure. different. Yeah. Um, nobody should ever feel pressured to have kids. Right. I, I'm, you know, I, that was just for me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know. I wanted more hardship. Mm -hmm. I was had plenty of hardship, but I wanted mm -hmm. more, I guess. And I, I wanted the challenge of it and, mm -hmm. and the beautiful parts as well. But I know that it's really hard undertaking. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would become like a better human being mm -hmm. and, and maybe a better artist if mm -hmm. I, I knew that part of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it was an act of resistance against myself. Um, in the borderlands where I live, um, you know, I, may, I have made it sound so militarized that it sounds like we're walking around <laughs> always worried, but it's not yeah. like that at all. I mean, life goes on. Life mm -hmm. is, is pretty much normal. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very calm uh, place to raise children. Mm -hmm. I feel really grateful mm -hmm. that um, they live in a place where people are very kind to mm. each other and mm. that there's a lot of love and mm. a lot of compassion mm. for, for each other. Um, you know, that the university I work at is 90% Latino, Latina. Mm. And so I feel really fortunate to be raising my kids there. Mm. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's more of an act of resistance against myself to, yeah. have, to have had kids because when I was growing up, right. my, um, my sisters had children fairly early in life, early meaning like twi early 20s. And mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, I love them. I love my nieces and nephews. 
but it's hard mm -hmm. you know it's so hard it takes your life mm -hmm. you know it takes your life to be able to raise them yeah and yeah. that's not to take away like they have their own lives right. too but right. in my mind i said that is so hard right. you know um so i think it's an act of resistance against my former thinking I, I think, about motherhood but i think that's such yeah. a that's such an underspoken perspective on motherhood and it, it is like a part of the experience of stepping as an individual to this like human act of raising another mm -hmm. life and i'm really um i have so much there's so much more that i that i want to ask you but I'm, I'm really so excited to see where um where that comes out in your work going forward oh, thank you everything that we've been talking thank about. thank you very and, much because yeah. i remember seeing at awp um a couple of years ago and it's always stuck in my mind that people and uh, women were like protesting sort of the assumptions that other people make about their writing. Mm -hmm. And one of them, they held up a sign and said, are you done writing your mommy poems yet? You know, I don't know. And, yeah. so, and so there's that too, you right. know, like, so I'm thinking, oh, people are going to say, oh, she's writing these poems about motherhood. Right, and, right. Oh, they're so cute and everything. And no, so, uh, yeah. And that's I, in my I, mind too, mm -hmm, you know, and so, definitely. and then I, I have to resist that too. Yes, right? yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's uh -huh. the real, um, there's a kind of immediate impression of like the challenge of motherhood, but that is also a script yes. that yeah. there that yeah. you know doesn't speak universally. And so when I say that I'm excited to read what comes Thank out you. of these poems, I don't mean you. like oh I'm so excited for the mommy poems. I mean I'm really yeah. I can I, I really see recognize that grappling and I thank you and there's so much more to say always like about motherhood and about these experiences. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you so you. much, thank you. Emmy. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate your close reading oh, of everything, I and you're just brilliant. So could thank just you. go on you're for just hours. Brilliant. <laughs> I just, no. um, thank you. I really thank you so really much for sharing <laughs> your life and your work, and really like the the vi vitality and like the real connection to self and experience like that. Um, uh, I really like is so nourishing to even just witness in part so thank you thank you, thank you so, so much, much. Yeah. thank you <laughs>